Last Wednesday being the first day of the season of Lent. Tonight I want to talk about applying to your life Lent's central theme. Applying to your life Lent's central theme. And Lent's central theme, if I was to put it simply and straightforwardly, which actually has very little to do with the chocolates or whatever else it is that you're giving up until Easter Day. The central theme of Lent is that to be a Christian is to be like Christ. That to be a Christian is to be like Christ. Now this is also the central theme of the Christian life itself, not just the central theme of Lent, which only goes to show how valuable and potentially fruitful the season of Lent is. We take it seriously and really make it our own. By making Lent a time for us to establish spiritual habits that we will take with us and use long after Lent is over. Now, notwithstanding all of this and that to be a Christian, to be a true Christian is to be like Christ, it's been often of particular interest to me, especially in more recent years, how often this central theme is conspicuously absent from America's, America's cultural uh, Christian ethos, or churches, the American church's cultural ethos, I should say. And, and my guess is that this is because the dominant culture within the American church, more often than not, tends to be more American than Christian. Indeed, the dominant philosophy that drives American culture, by and large, is a thing called consumerism. That is the belief that the more I have, the happier I'll be. And so when consumerism takes its place at the center of the church's culture, the church's central message is not so much a call to follow Christ and be like Christ, which is what Christ himself actually calls us to do. But rather when consumerism is at the center the primary message of the church becomes a message about all the things that one stands to get from Christ if one will only be willing to take from Christ the things he has to give. And of course this message fits well within the philosophy of consumerism that the more I have, the happier I'll be. Now truth be told, the gifts of Christ are many. And with Christ, there's lots to be gotten. But in the scriptures, these are the things gotten and that come to us by faith. And the genuine, genuineness of our faith is not determined by the things that we say, but rather by the things that we do. And the primary thing that we're called to do is to be like Christ. In fact, just the last Sunday, we noted the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, words that um, one doesn't always hear in a church, uh, but they're the words of Christ, and they were ones that he repeated over and over, and ones that are, apparently were very important to him, and ones that he wanted to be sure that we were hearing and that we were doing. Matthew 16 and verse 24 begins, and if anyone would come after me, Notice, if it's anyone, if anyone would come after me, that is, if anyone would be a follower of mine, or as we would put it, if anyone would be a Christian, if anyone would be a true believer, if anyone would come after me, Jesus says, number one, let him deny himself, say no to self, take up his cross, which was an instrument of torture and death. And follow me. In fact, I am Jesus, the Messiah, and I am headed to the kingdom that is yet to come. But the road that leads to that begins with a stop in Jerusalem where I will be mistreated and shamefully abused and crucified on the cross. I'll rise, I'll ascend, I'll reign. But anyone who would follow me has to go the same road. Indeed, that's why this is so important. And why it relates to what we're saying overall. 
the meta message. And that is that Jesus denied himself. You remember in his time of great anguish in the garden, what did he pray? Not my will, but thine be done. Jesus himself was a disciple. He wasn't asking us to do anything he doesn't do or didn't do. But because the way of the cross is the way of life and peace and it's the road that leads to eternal life, he tells us to take up our cross and follow him. And to do so is to be like Christ. Or as Jesus says earlier in this Gospel of Matthew in the 10th chapter, Beginning at verse 24, he says, a disciple's not above his teacher. See, Jesus Christ isn't like our cosmic valet to call upon when we need him, and otherwise we're okay, we're running our own parade. A disciple's not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. Jesus says, it's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher. And the servant like his master. And that is the essential nature of discipleship. And so being like Christ, not just making use of him. Being like Christ is not a peripheral matter as if you might get round to it or not. In fact, being like Christ is a central matter. And if you and I would be like Christ... We must do as he did. And so what did Jesus do? And of course, Jesus did lots of things and too many things for us to enumerate tonight. But there are some things that Jesus did, even some things that are traditionally associated with Lent uh, that we might mention. For instance, Jesus prayed. He prayed in formal ways, like we're doing tonight, he prayed at temple, and he prayed in the synagogue, he prayed the liturgy of the Jews in both of those settings. He participated in it. He made it to Jerusalem at least for the three festivals that were celebrated and that every male Jew at the time was required to do by Mosaic law. And he went there, and he prayed. And he prayed in the synagogue, which he went to every Sabbath. In fact, Jesus was a faithful churchgoer, we might say. He went, to, he went to church or he went to synagogue every week and participated in the, in the worship and in the prayers. And so he prayed formally and then he prayed informally. Perhaps we even know more about that because it's mentioned so much in the New Testament. It is having a conversation informally with God and just talking to God as you would talk to anyone else. He did this sometimes on retreat. And he would go away from the rest of the group and go away from the crowd. Sometimes the disciples would come looking for him and say, don't you understand there's all of this going on and all these people are running? But that was important to him and so he did it on a regular basis. Sometimes, in fact, it's interesting if you read the Gospels, he'll stop right what he's doing in the, in the middle of the crowd and look up and talk to God in front of everybody else in a very conversational way. And so Jesus prayed. You might say he was a man of prayer. And if we would be like Jesus, we will be people and individuals of prayer. Because that's what Jesus did. And so Jesus prayed. And Jesus fasted. Indeed, when Jesus gives us instruction on fasting, he doesn't say, and if you fast, but rather when you fast. It seems to suggest that Jesus just assumed that those who follow him would fast just like he did. And that's just the point. We fast because Jesus fasted. It's interesting, you know, that section that we read tonight, there's mention of fasting and, and giving and praying. There's three things, right? Giving. Oh, there's lots of talk about that in the church. We, we have a, a three-part series every fall on stewardship. And we talk a lot about prayer. You might be, you know, the, in fact, the women are doing the study. The essentials of effective prayer. 
But mea culpa. Where's the five-part series on effective fasting? Maybe we need to have that. I think I'm going to make a note of that, and we'll talk a little bit more about fasting. But to fast and to pray and to give is to is discipleship. Is to do what Jesus did. Of course, if you have a health condition or something like that, and you're listening to this, and you think, "Well, that's something that I need to do." Uh, if that's true of you, then maybe you might want to consult a physician so that you know hurt yourself. But if you don't have uh, such a, a condition, uh, you might want to take it up um, if you never have. And don't feel bad. Lots of preachers don't do it either. You know what? I'll tell you what. You know, the, the, four, the, the, the official days of fasting in our tradition is Ash Wednesday, like today, and Good Friday. And for quite some time, I did that. In fact, that, that was the only time I fasted uh, because I didn't particularly like it. And then I got so, I was so cranky on Good Fridays and Ash Wednesdays, and I just gave it up altogether. Because I had the wrong thing in my mind. I was doing it because it was in the introductory material of the Book of Common Prayer. And I hadn't made the connection that this is what Jesus does, or what Jesus did. And when it dawned on me that this is what Jesus did, and he didn't say if you fast, but when you fast, because I was all about discipleship. I thought, yeah, I want to be a good disciple. Well, I took it up. And I found it to be a, a, a quite a different experience as what I was experiencing before when I was just doing it because it was noted in the front of the prayer book. And I think that, I hope that that's true with most of these things. The fact that you love Christ and you want to follow Christ. What did he do? Let me be covered in the dust of my rabbi. And if he fasted, then I'll fast too. And so that's why we do it. And interestingly enough, I mean, we mentioned prayer and then we mentioned fasting. Secondly, in fact, prayer and fasting go hand in hand. In fact, if you're fasting and you're not praying, they have another word for that. It's called a diet. But that's not fasting. I tell people who are on a diet, pray while you're dieting and while you're feeling hungry and turn it into fasting. Why waste the experience? Turn it into a spiritual one. But fasting and prayer go hand in hand. Indeed, fasting is saying no to food and saying no to the demands of the flesh, which you do have power to do if you want to do it. So you say no to the flesh in order to say yes to God. In a heightened spiritual intensity, I would, I would, as I would describe it. Connecting with God even in the midst of your hunger. In fact, when the hunger comes, it's a prompting to talk to God. And for those who practice it, they know what a unique spiritual pleasure I would even dare to call it. Sometimes I talk to staff and talked about, how, well, how's the fast going on? I'm experiencing hunger joy. And I'm not the only one. And those who practice it know what a joy and how empowering it can be. So Jesus prayed and Jesus fasted. And then Jesus was a serious student of Holy Scripture. In fact, Jesus, or for Jesus, I should say, Scripture was essential to life itself. In fact, to this coming Sunday, in fact, on the first uh, Sunday in Lent, it, the, 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 gospel, uh, the gospel passage is always the temptation of Christ, depending on which year we're in, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, when we get finished with Luke, then we go right back to Matthew. But just like the last Sunday in Epiphany is always the transfiguration, so the first Sunday in Lent is always the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. And the devil saying, you know, if, if you're the son of God, which is, he actually was saying, since you are the son of God, it's a first class condition, conditional statement in the Greek. Since you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And what did Jesus say in response? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In fact, interesting, as we're talking about Jesus' relationship to the scripture, 
in each instance in which he, re he responded to the, to the temp to temptings of the devil, he quoted scripture. And so Jesus read scripture. And he lived the scriptures. And he shared the scriptures with others because his mind and his heart was filled with the scriptures. And if you would be a follower of Christ, you will be a man or a woman of the scriptures, just like you'll be a man or a woman of prayer. And a man or a woman of fasting. Although you're to be excused if you haven't tried that one yet. But try it. If you're doing it to be like him, I suspect you would probably be quite satisfied. Now, as it happens at Holy Cross, as we're talking about scripture, there's opportunities all the time for people to deepen their relationship with God by becoming more familiar with what God is saying to them in Holy Scripture. And this is happening on a regular basis at, at Holy Cross, with Holy Cross men, Holy Cross women, Holy Cross youth, Holy Cross uh, children, uh, and even on Sunday mornings, because on Sunday mornings we always do an exposition of the text with which we're dealing with, and all of that in hopes that people that are learning and participating in these ministries will be inspired to read and study the Holy Scriptures for themselves, which I know that many of you are doing because you tell us about it in those studies. And that's an inspiring thing indeed. And so Jesus prayed and Jesus fasted. Jesus was a serious student of Scripture. But then what else did Jesus do? Well, Jesus served, didn't he? Jesus wasn't just a consumer. He didn't just come in and get something. He got something and he gave something. He wasn't just a consumer, he was a contributor. And for him, seemingly, no service was too undignified. I think he pretty much settled that when he stooped down like a slave and washed the disciples' feet. You ever do that? Somebody's like, asking you to do something. Like, I'm not doing that. You ever do that? Well, that, that applies to some of you, because I've heard it around the church. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Well, let's just think about those stinky, dirty feet. And I think that probably was the point that Jesus was making. In fact, you remember that Peter balked. This is his Messiah, man. Forget the cross. And you remember that Peter, uh, James and John, I mean, they wanted to sit on, on his right and on his left. Well, let somebody else wash our feet, Jesus. And Peter said, you will never wash my feet. I, I'm, you're embarrassing me over here. And Jesus said, but if you don't let me wash you, you can have no part with me. And then he wraps it all up at the end. He says, and this, you, do you know what I've done for you? And if I, your rabbi, if I, your Lord, if I, your master, would wash your feet, then you ought to wash one another's feet. And it's not just about washing one another's feet. When I wash your feet or do some other thing to serve you in even the most menial way, I'm being, or you are, if it applies to you, you are being like Christ. And so he served. And he gave. In fact, he gave everything, even his own life, happily, to reach you and reach me. And he loved, and he didn't just love his friends, of which seeming there, they were really only a few. He loved his enemies. He was concerned about their welfare as well. And he was merciful. Jesus looked past people's faults and saw their need. That's what it means to be merciful. And he was just. I mean, he was righteous. He was, you could de depend on Jesus to do the right thing. You have people like that in your life? Well, I'm not exactly, you know, this is going on. 
well, so-and-so is in charge, and you say, well, if she's in charge, I'm, I'm sure she'll do the right thing. That was, Jesus was that kind of person. He was just, and he was fair, and he was humble. Isn't that an extraordinary thing? In fact, that was sort of one of the points that Paul makes in that famous passage in Philippians chapter 2. That Jesus didn't consider divinity a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself. I love it, the old King James. He made himself of no reputation. So that nobody would particularly notice. Because that wasn't important. All that was important was that he was the son with whom the father was well pleased. <laughs> and so he was humble. In fact, you have to be humble to wash other people's feet. And so if we would be like Christ, we must do as he did. But what are we to do when we fail to do what Christ did? Are we to give up? I would say, what's the use? You know, kind of like, what is it now? What is this, 22nd of February? How many of you are still going to the gym like you said you would on the 1st of January? And then you go, what's the use? Right. So, so what, do I, what do I do? What do you do when we fail to do what Christ did? Do we give up? Do we say, what's the use? Not at all. In fact, when we fail, God calls us to repent. To repent literally means to think again. Metanoia in the Greek. It means, that word literally means to think again. Or we would say to change our mind. And so if I'm heading in the wrong direction, I repent and I head in the right direction. I make a change. It is, uh, if you like, a, a, the resetting of your spiritual GPS. And the stopping of going in the wrong way and instead starting to move in the right way again. So when we fail, God calls us to repent. That word seems a, 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 a threatening one to people, but it's indicative of a, of a new start. It's a wonderful word. It means that I, it is worth moving on and that God is working with me to get me moving again in the right direction. And then when we fail, God calls us to confess, which is a, a related idea. In fact, you remember when John the Baptist was baptizing people with a baptism of repentance on the Jordan River, he was requiring that the people confess their sins. It's right there in the Gospels. To confess, the word homologeo means to say the same thing. That's what a confession is, to say the same thing. What? Relative to what God says about the sin that you need to confess. And so it's not a rationalizing of sin or making excuses for it, which unfortunately is on some of our hard drives. It's almost like a reflex that when we do wrong, it's somebody else's fault. And if you didn't do this, but to confess is to say the same thing to admit our failure and to say to God the same thing that God says about the sin that we're confessing. And what's beautiful is that God's promise to those who confess is forgiveness, cleansing, and a fresh start. In fact, you're familiar with the text. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In other words, what he's saying is that when you say you have no sin, you are a liar. But, verse 9, if we confess our sins, in fact, that's to tell the truth. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us, to wash us from all unrighteousness. Amen. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.